My name is Daria. I work from I work for Outbrain, and today I'm gonna tell you about how we built real-time analytics dashboard built uh, based on Apache Druid, Spark Streaming, and Kafka. Few words about me. I'm a software engineer with more than 15 years of experience. I last several years I'm dealing mostly with big data technologies. I started with Adobe, Hive, or Produce, and uh, now I'm dealing mostly with Druid, Spark Streaming, and Kafka. So, what is Outbrain? Outbrain is a content discovery platform. We serve content recommendations for users, and uh, we help users to discover things that are uh, interesting and relevant. We serve our recommendations on websites, applications, and news fields. Uh, we help them, we, install, we are installed on many publishers such as CNN, MSN, uh, BBC and many others. We help them drive users engagement with content by powering a personalized field, feed. Uh, we deal at high scale, for example, we have 8, 820 million of monthly users. We have, uh, we serve 290 billion of monthly recommendations and our recommendations are shown on one dot eight billion of pages a day. So what is the, uh, the agenda for today? I will start with the motivation. Why did we do uh, real-time analytics? What problem we try to solve? Then I will represent our architecture for, uh, for real-time analytics. Then I will describe the problem with, that we had with this architecture. And I will describe our ways to solution step by step, what worked on every step, and I will describe the working solution. So, the motivation uh, for real-time analytics. Uh, while serving recommendations, our services produce a lot of data. For example, we collect all clicks and impressions to our systems. First, they go to Hadoop and Hive, and then there are many aggregation, many ETL processes that aggregate data from Hive in various ways and insert it into Vertica. And finally, we have business reports in Tableau. And uh, the problem is that all this cycle takes several hours. It's about four hours and everything works okay. So it means that we need to wait for four hours in order to get some business insight from our data. So the motivation is to reduce this cycle. We want to analyze data fresh as it arrives in real time or near real time mode. For example, if we create a new campaign, we want to understand how does this campaign performs? Does it do well? Maybe we need to configure it in a different way. So we need this feedback very very fast. Or we create a new widget recommendations in a new publisher. We also want to get this feedback very quickly. We don't want to wait for four hours to get some business feedback on our data. So the idea was to build a real-time dashboard based on Kafka events. We already have uh, Kafka events. We work massively with Kafka. We use it internally by our services. So we were looking for a tool that can consume this Kafka data and to get our some uh, analytics, some visual representation of our data. And uh, we tried Druid for, the, for this. Actually, we had an internal hackathon at the company and we tried Druid. And uh, it was uh, very interesting and good. And then we built a production grade solution for Druid. So what is Druid? Uh, Druid is a column-oriented, open-source distributed data store. It is commonly used for uh, BI for analytics, for analyzing high volume of streaming and historical data. And there is a product called Imply. It's based it's ba upon a Druid. It's based on Druid, and uh, it uh, provides a high performance per uh, visualization of streaming and historical data. And the keyword for us here is streaming. Imply and Druid has very good integration with Kafka. It means that you actually go to Druid, you define, you specify where your data in Kafka resides, you specify Kafka topic, 
and Druid creates a consumer from these Kafka events, and then this data is available for various kinds of visualization and analytics in Druid. So this is what we try to do. And actually, in order to build the, this is still kind of idea, in order to build the complete architecture, we need to understand some more constraints and the details. So we have that in Kafka, as I already mentioned. But we can't uh, connect it directly to Druid because our data in Kafka is in our format. And it's even customized format. So we need to implement our logic in order to get events from Kafka. We can't just connect it directly through it with this Kafka data. Druid can't read, read this. Druid actually reads uh, JSON format and, uh, G and CSV format from Kafka. Okay. In addition, our data in, in Kafka it uh, contains a uh, kind of table, like uh, events with uh, various types of IDs. For example, click contains publisher ID, ma ma marketer ID, and so on. Let's recall that our goal is to build some analytics tool for visualization. So we need to add more human readable data in our Kafka events. We need to enrich every event in Kafka with more fields, for example, we want to add publisher name based on publisher ID. We want to add marketer name based on marketer ID. We need to add more fields to every event in Kafka. Okay. So having these uh, constraints in mind, we came up with the following architecture. Here we see our original Kafka data in our format, raw data. Then we added Spark streaming jobs that consume these events and uh, uh, it opens the other format, it uh, writes uh, the output in JSON format, and also it uh, makes all uh, several kinds of enrichment. It adds publisher name and marketer name and many other fields to every event in Kafka. And uh, so this Spark streaming, again, it reads from Kafka and writes to another Kafka topic, which is JSON format, it contains enriched data. And now this Kafka topic is ready to go to Druid. This is the architecture that we have. Actually, it's not complicated. I know other companies that use similar architecture, like it should be very easy, very straightforward. And like, let's go and implement it. So let's get started with this architecture. Let's implement it. What do we have? We have Spark. OK, we have some experience with Spark before, so it shouldn't be a problem. Right? We have Kafka. As I already mentioned, we work massively with Kafka. We have a lot of experience in, in, with Kafka. It shouldn't be a problem, again. OK, I have read Spark Stream and Kafka Integration Guide to understand some tweaks and details regarding Spark Streaming. It's also very straightforward, very easy. So I deployed my first Sparks uh, job into production, and we started loaded, loading data into Druid. We were very excited about it. And uh, actually, oh, here it's, the screen is not so clear, but here we see how the data in Druid looks like. Like on the left, we see, they call it data cube, like time, timeline of events of data. And here we see data when we, uh, when we aggregate it by some dimensions. This is how we see data in a normal case. So we were very excited about it, like I get my job done, we have data in Druid, everything is fine, everything is okay. And then we run into, into a problem. Spark streaming job, the, the idea of Spark streaming job, the job is running forever. This job should never stop. It constantly reads events from one Kafka topic and writes them to another Kafka topic. There is no stop condition for this. But actually, this is an optimistic view. In real time, things are more complicated. We have uh, Spark driver failure. In this case, the job is restarted. 
Sometimes we need to deploy a new version of our Spark streaming application into production. In this case, we need to stop our job and we run it again. What happens with data in Druid when we have this restart? This is how we see data in Druid. We definitely see data lost for this period. This is when the Spark streaming job was restarted. We see data lost. It's not good. We cannot continue with this. We need to search for a solution. Let's recall our, our architecture. Exactly. This is what I asked when I see this. We still have that in, in, in Kafka, right? So it depends on the retention. If the events are still in Kafka, we should be able to continue consume them from the same point, right? So it's very straightforward. So this is what I try to understand when I got this picture, that I got this situation in the root. Okay, so try to understand this exactly as you asked. Okay, so again, we have Spark streaming job. It reads events from one Kafka topic, writes them into another. There is no aggregation, like the same amount of data, which is here, of events is, is, is added here. So again, when Spark streaming job is restarted, we see data lost. When I started to search for the solution, I realized that actually it's related to Kafka offsets. Let's talk a little, about, uh, a little about Kafka. Kafka is a distributed streaming platform. It's used for data pipelines, and it gets producer API, which enables us to write, ev write events to Kafka, and it gets us consumer API, which actually uh, enables us to consume events from a Kafka topic. And topic is a stream of events in the, in the cluster. Each topic is divided into partition, and each message, each event into a partition is assigned a unique number called offset. And this number is constantly growing in each partition. Uh, when consumer cons consumes the topic, uh, it can specify how, the, how it starts consuming. The default is to consume from latest offset. This is the default behavior. You also can specify that your application wants to consume from the earliest offset. In this case, we will consume the whole content of the Kafka topic. Right? And there is a way to commit offset and to specify from which offset exactly we want to start consuming our data from Kafka. So the data loss happens because the default behavior is to consume from latest offset. So when our Spark application is down, the new events are added to Kafka. We always have clicks and impressions and new events. And, and after the restart, we consume from latest offset. So we lose all these events that were added. So OK, it still should be easier when we understand it, right? Let's commit our offsets. And that's all, right? So the first stop was, uh, step was to use auto commit offset. It's a very naive approach, but I still want to show you because it helps to understand the, the whole picture. There is a flag called enable auto commit in Kafka. When it's true, it uh, actually commits offsets from time to time. Okay? It's also related to another uh, parameter called and the inter which specifies the interval. So actually, by default, this uh, parameter is false in Spark streaming. I just change it to true. Very naive approach again. And I restarted my application. And this is what we get. I hope you can see, because the screen is not so bright, but here we, we see another kind of problem. We don't see the gap. We don't see data loss anymore. But we see kind of spike of events. Why does it happen? It happens because now we see duplicate events. When a committing offset happens from time to time, and the, the application uh, is uh, shut down, we still have, we write some events to output Kafka topic, but we didn't commit them, right? So after the restart, we will write them again. So this is why we, why we have duplicate events. Actually, it's not correct way uh, for committing offsets in Spark streaming. There is a proper way according to documentation of Spark streaming Kafka integration guide. 
the proper way is to commit Kafka offset manually. Uh, when Spark streaming uh, reads the, uh, events from Kafka, internally it builds uh, micro batches. And, uh, and then each micro batch is processed by Spark core engine. They call it RDD, Resilient Distributed Data Set. So this RDD contains events of two minutes from Kafka to topic. This RDD contains next two minutes of events, okay, and so on. And when we process RDD, we, it is recommended to commit offset in the end of each RDD. Okay. In this code snippet, we see it's taken from the from Spark streaming documentation. This is how we should commit our offsets. So first, we should take, we should store offset ranges into variable. Then we need to we add our processing, whatever we need to do with the stream. In our case, we add various enrichments and we handle our format and we write it to the uh, JSON format. So every logic is according to use case. And finally, this is what we have for committing also this API. Commit async API and we uh, have this our we store our offsets to the we pass our offsets to commit async API. Okay, this is from Spark integration guide, Spark streaming. So after uh, implementing this according to this guide, I still I hope you can see this. I still see the spike. It happens because we can shut down our application in the middle of RDD processing. This case, we still have duplicate event. Sometimes, in our case, sometimes we have 30 million of events in two minutes micro batch. So at our scale, it's still not good. We need to search for a better solution. And here comes graceful shutdown feature of Spark. Let's talk a little bit about Spark application. Like, I write my code and I deploy it to the Spark. I deploy it to the framework. It's not a regular Java Scala application when I write all the code, right? How can I stop it? Uh, Spark comes with Spark UI. Actually, it's a web UI which shows all Spark jobs running in, 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 the, in the cluster. And you can go to a specific job and write a lot of information for every job, like how many micro batches did it process, how many records were in every micro batch, and really a lot of data for every job. But how can I kill the job? I have just the kill button in Spark UI. Okay. Also, there is API for killing the application. Both these ways just terminate the GVM, terminate the process in the cluster. Okay. And uh, in addition, there is a graceful shutdown feature. In order to enable it, we should create our context with stop gracefully on shutdown true. This tells uh, Spark to, uh, to shut down gracefully on GVM error, GVM shutdown. And uh, also, we can stop context with stop gracefully true. This is what we do in our application, uh, in our code. But still, in Spark UI, we still have only the kill button. We don't have a mechanism to tell the job when should it shut down. Because when we kill it, it happens, it can happen in the middle of, RD, of RDD processing. We still, we will still have uh, duplicate events in this spike and route. So there is no built-in solution for Spark to notify job to shut down gracefully. Like they have this kind of uh, API, but it's not enough. So we need to think of this mechanism by ourselves, how to notify job to shut down. There are several ways to do it. And we started with a HDFS file. Oh, but uh, one moment. Uh, actually, I want to go through this. When, uh, when we have the graceful shutdown feature, what Spark uh, actually promises, it, uh, it, stop, first it stops reading data new events from Kafka. 
and then it processes all cube events, all micro batches that we already read from Kafka, and only then it stops the job the job's execution. So this is exactly what we need. We need this behavior. Okay? But still, how can we tell? The, how can we notify a job to shut down? Mm -hmm. We added this snippet code, uh, this code pattern to every hour of jobs. We have the while loop that constantly checking for existing of a HDFS file. So when we wanted to shut down uh, the job, we just put HDFS file to, to the HDFS. So every hour job, we're checking for shutdown file. Uh, actually, it, uh, it is okay for the beginning, but uh, when we deal with high scale, like now we have several Spark streaming clusters and we have many jobs running on every cluster, it's not so convenient to connect to HDFS and just to put some markup file to shut down. So later we improved it. We have our internal service that handles all our Spark streaming jobs. And we have some nice UI so I can go and mark some job to shut down. And instead of checking HDFS file or our Spark streaming jobs, I just have the call the API that we have internally. But the idea is very similar, it's the same. We need some condition that every Spark streaming job should check. And then when this condition is true, the job should call stop service, we stop gracefully true. Do you have any questions? Okay. What happens when the streaming application Okay, good question. When the spark, not, uh, when there is a spark uh, failure, like driver failure, uh, we have, we created our spark stream in context with gracefully true. So this flag notifies spark itself to shut down gracefully. Mm -hmm. Like if you've killed the process, there is no way to recover. But if there are, there are a lot of recovery inside of spark, spark, the spark detects it and restarts the application. So, if there is driver, yeah, then there is no way. Yeah, but if it detects some problem, like out of memory or many other problems, it knows to, to shut down gracefully. So basically, you can just sign it once to the next Kafka. So why do you have a so For example, I have seen in the queue, I finish the processing, send it, and only then I put it on the queue, but it should not have a duplicate. Exactly, but what? Uh, but it should come together with graceful shutdown, right? Because if you just kill the job, you can kill it in the middle of RDD processing, like you still did not commit the micro batch. In the and when I go up, I the you did so uh, exactly, and in this case, you will have duplicate events because you will start from earlier point, and you will process some of events twice. You will write them twice to output Kafka top. So there is cases that you are pushing into the next Kafka before you commit it? We push it and then we commit it. Yeah. Yeah. Because we can't, we don't commit event by event. We commit the micro batch. But you send event by event. You send event by event and you commit by micro on the end of micro batch. Okay? So it's not transactional. So when it fails in the middle, you will have duplicate events. Yeah. Okay? It could be approached, but uh, you know. Yeah, but we still the solution that I show you will work like zero, like zero lost. Yeah. What happens if the driver just crashes? If the driver just crashes, crashes before if you kill the process or something, you will still have the duplicate events. Okay. But what? There is no solution for that in Druid to deduplicate events? Like you can add some other pro processing. Okay. You can do it in Kafka if Druid already read the 
You can build additional solution, but actually this solution works very well. Like we have, I monitor many Spark streaming jobs, and I see this uh, like drive failures in the cluster, and the jobs are restarted, and I see that uh, sh shut down gracefully. Okay, like if you go to machine and kill the GVM, it will not uh, recover. But uh, it actually, didn't see it happen. Okay. You know, after, sp uh, after implementing the gra graceful shutdown, actually I was sure that I'm done and everything is fine, but we still see uh, duplicate events. And uh, I had kind of, uh, kind of surprise using commit async API. This is API that we use for committing offset. It turns out that actually this, commit this API does not really commit offset. It just write them into memory. This line is taken from the documentation. So commit async KPI, queue up offset ranges for commit to Kafka at future time. It means that it just queue them up, and when does it really commit? On the next RDD. This is how Spark Streaming commit API works, okay? So it was kind of a surprise for me, so we can't use this API. So we needed to implement a synchronously API by ourselves, so we store our offset synchronously in HDFS file on every RDD. And when jobs start up, they are looking for offset file, and then uh, they continue con consuming from Kafka from specific offsets. Okay. And then if there are no offset file, then our jobs start uh, committing from latest offsets. So this is actually the, the step that I described. We need to commit our offsets synchronously in HDFS. So let's see the final solution, the solution that worked for us. Only the combination of graceful shutdown and storing Kafka offsets synchronously solved the problem. Okay? And uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, material about this in the web. Like people write about graceful shutdown, they describe how you should send your SIG term signal to a job, which parameters exactly you need to pass, and then they describe list of limitations, like you need to have a spe specific operating system, and it supports only specific Spark version, and you need to, to connect to a specific machine that runs your driver. Like, it's not scalable, it's not good for our case. I don't want to know which machine runs my Spark driver. I don't want to connect to a specific machine. It's not good for us. And also there are a lot of, uh, there is material about Spark, uh, about committing uh, offsets, commit async API. Like people write that it's asynchronously, that it doesn't really save offsets. And people write, okay, just add some post-processing step to your Spark streaming, to your Kafka, and handle these duplicates. We wanted to solve it in one step. We want to have one application that handles everything. We don't want to add more hope, like more service that, that duplicates the messages. It uh, increases latency of events, and it complicates the system. So the solution that uh, we built, actually it works for a common case. Okay, it doesn't depend on Spark uh, version, on operating system, and you don't need to know which, drive, which machine runs your driver. Okay? Here we can see that it actually works. This is how our data in Druid looks like when we restart the job several times, like here and here. We see that there are no not data loss, there are no sparks, and this is exactly how we wanted to see it in Druid. Okay. So, yeah, now we have reliable data in Druid. We can trust our data. We added more topics, we added more events, we added more enrichment to our data. Like every product manager that uh, we show him our uh, Druid, they tell, yeah, we need this data and we need more fields to our events. We need this enrichment. It's, it's very, very exciting to have this. Okay. And we actually started to build uh, various uh, dashboards based on our streaming data. Okay. We've shown it to other team and there are teams that use these uh, dashboards and build decision according to streaming data. And it's actually very exciting.
And from my personal point of view, it was kind of a journey. We added new technology to the company. We started with small hackathon and with internal hackathon and we uh, built one cluster and now we have two big clusters of Druid and we have several teams that work with Druid. That's very nice. And also from personal uh, perspective, it was very interesting to deal with this offset and Spark and RDD and to understand how to combine these technologies, how it works together at high scale. So now I get a better understanding about this. Okay. And finally, I'd like to recommend you to read my blog post in Medium about uh, Spark streaming and Kafka and Root. Actually it describes the use case that I represent, presented you today and it was the trigger for today's meetup. This blog post. Any questions? Yeah. In your experience, what is the scale that you really get into COVID? How many events do you ingest? How many daily, weekly? How much do you retain? How much queries can you do directly, concurrently? Okay. We have several streams, about, uh, as I mentioned, 30 million or 40 million events per two minutes. So this is, uh, but we have several streams like this. Okay, it depends on the cluster, it depends on how you build a cluster. Okay? And uh, regarding the queries, right now we have uh, mostly the use case of uh, dashboards that uh, goes for teams. But now we, we built another dashboard for our public API based on Druid. We still don't have it in production, but the rate will be higher. But uh, actual Druid, I know in other companies, they work at, uh, like squares work very fast and big, big scale. Yeah. Why did you use Spark Streaming more recently? What? Why did you use Spark Streaming what? Okay, Spark Streaming more recently. Case streams, Kafka streams. Uh. Case equal. Case equal, you can actually reach the data based on the data streams. Uh, the product is out for a year, I think. So I'm just wondering why like, this is Spark Stream and not Spark Stream. I think uh, another team used several streaming technologies. We came to conclusion that we use Spark. And uh, we have experience with Spark with another. Project, so we use the uh, yeah. We we thought, yeah, we didn't have sp this specific case, uh, and we we tried to to use this, yeah, and uh, you know you can't just try everything. There are a lot of technology, yeah. Two questions actually. Okay, you, uh, uh, have you ever considered? Uh, Using other streaming processing engines like Flink as a possible option? Maybe you can try to put it down? We didn't try it, no. no. And another question is you mentioned previously the dirty graph part of the historical view. My understanding is that who is the game as a replacement to do that again? Not exactly. No, we still have a lot of ETL. We have like about 1,000 1, ETL jobs run into our Vertica hourly, and we can't just replace it with Root. So we built a separate use case for real-time analytics. Like in Vertica, we still have a lot of historical data, and it used for we have Tableau. We still have this system, but this the Druid system it comes on top. We we try now actually to combine historical data with real-time real data in Druid and combine reports based on this of fresh data and historical data. Yeah. Another question? We started uh, set and then we got some help for uh, e-planning yeah. to get uh, to get the uh, stable and to scale it. So uh, again, it's, uh, the code is a uh, one-man show of uh, Daria. So, uh, yeah. That's why we didn't try too much technologies and uh, too many things that uh, uh, one person needs to do it. So we started to make uh, and 
and about Vertica, so we are uh, in Alpring, we believe in uh, best of breed uh, to take the, the right tool for the right uh, use case and Vertica is great for BI and uh, all the historical data we have in Vertica and it works well, but if everything is aggregated and it needs to be loaded like we are loading in our batch and the, the and route was perfect for us for the real time to consume for Kafka and to get up to one minute uh, uh, data so we can see really what's happening now and like uh, it's a, you can make Vertica do it in I don't know 15 minutes uh, batches but it will require a lot of work and it's not uh, like the right uh, tool for, for the case so and we believe also that in product wise it's two different use cases if you care about the, the real time data and uh, you want to see like what happened in the last uh, few hours that you change the CPC uh, versus week of a week, or uh, and it's a different use case if you want to look at uh, your campaign, what it did in the last year, and uh, what was your budget uh, doing and stuff. So that's it. Uh, Actually, regarding our DevOps uh, team, they went, uh, they worked with us closely, they took part in Hackathon, they installed Cluster for us, and actually they uh, always, they, they now built two big clusters. I heard about 20 machines, okay, so we need to work with them together. But um, I heard about some problems, but actually they, had, they get through it. Okay, so we, we have it working on production. And uh, regarding, again, the, the use case that we tried to push is the streaming data, is to analyze the streaming data. Druid has very strong visualization tool, like you really play with data. You just drag some fields and the data is aggregated. You can analyze week over week, like it shows you what well, the amount of events a week ago, and you compare what happens now, and you still can aggregate like for specific location or for specific publisher. So it's very, very strong, strong tool for our analysts. No questions? So we don't we don't need to pre-aggregate. We still like we have raw events in Kafka and Spark streaming does not add any aggregation, it just adds an enrichment. We call our internal API for adding more fields to every Kafka event, but they are not pre-aggregated. And the Druid stores the event in columnar format in very, uh, very efficient, effective, efficient format, so it's available for various kinds of aggregation just on the fly. We don't need to specify indexes like in other databases when you need to think of, of possible future queries. We don't do it in Druid. Okay, thank you.